Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Jemanski. I'm the educator from, for Ag and Natural Resources here at Purdue Extension in Perry County, Indiana. I'm happy to be your host for our monthly Purdue Extension Sheep and Goat webinars. Today, I'm happy to bring to you Dr. Michael Neary, our Purdue Extension Small Ruminant Specialist. And his background is very much in small ruminant nutrition. So today he's going to share with us the nutrition management and body condition scoring to improve breeding performance in sheep and goats. So with no further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Neary. As Sarah mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about some breeding season uh, topics today, primarily uh, some management techniques, some nutritional strategies, and then how body condition scoring ties into all of that. Um, a very important topic, um, not a difficult topic, um, some very simple strategies can be employed to increase uh, reproductive performance of your ewes or your does, and uh, especially you can hopefully try to reduce your labor needs at, at lambing or kidding as also. I will focus today on the ewe and doe management to achieve these goals. I will touch on ram and buck management, and then we'll tie it all together um, talking about some of the nutritional strategies and just general management strategies to try to increase reproductive performance. Okay, so through this management, through this nutritional strategies, um, we can influence, number one, the lambing and kidding rate. Um, we can employ either a nutritional program and a management program to increase ovulation rate, which then, as more eggs are ovulated, uh, the chance of uh, them becoming fertilized obviously increases, and it should increase your twinning rate. Um, also, something that's very important is the number of females that actually become pregnant. Uh, typically, even in a well-managed sheep and goat operation, you're going to have 2 to 5% of of the females uh, that are open or non-pregnant and that's kind of a normal range however we don't want 10 percent or eight percent or 14 percent or something like that so if we can keep that number that are that are um actually pregnant you know 95 percent or higher we, we've done a pretty good job and we can affect that positively through our through our management and nutrition we also can uh, um influence the length of the lambing and kidding season. If our ewes and our does are in good shape, if they're ready to breed, if they're cycling normal, if you've got fertile bucks, uh, then there's no reason that lambing and kidding should stretch over three or four different cycles, uh, which would be, you know, 60 to 80 days, which gets to be, I think it's to be a long time for lambing and kidding and burnout certainly can come into it. So if we can keep our lambing and kidding season within two cycles, you know, 35 to 40 days, that certainly can affect labor inputs, sh uh, shepherd burnout, um, you know, you got more even lambs, you got more even kids, they can all be managed the same, they can be weaned at the same time, et cetera, it just makes things easier. Uh, that is a decrease in labors. This is not a complicated topic, <clears throat> but it's an important topic. It's a proven topic. And what is really the critical part of this is um, the timing of employing these management strategies. In a timely basis, we can positively affect uh, our operation. And, you know, if you look at the research data around some of the publications on this, essentially you can increase the, number, the percentage of lambs and kids born by up to 20%. And especially at today's markets, that's very significant. So, timing, very, very important. Getting the management and nutrition program done or started where it has time to create a positive effect is very crucial. So this is late June here in, in 2021, which some of you are probably thinking, why would I be worried about breeding season right now? But if you're lambing or kidding in, in January and February, now is the time to be doing some of these things. If you are, um, if you lamb and kid later in the season, say March and April, 
you've got a little more time, but it's certainly not a, a bad idea to be thinking about what you need to do. So the time's now, and uh, these are things to be to con to consider. So basically, about six weeks before you want to turn the ram or buck in, there's some things you can do to positively affect productivity, especially reproductive productivity. First is you want to evaluate the females. Get them all up, gather them up, run them through the chute, give them a good work over in terms of health situation, uh, soundness, you know, examine things like make sure their eyes look okay, you don't have any pink eye, examine their teeth. Um, you've got some with broken mouths, might be a good time to call some of those. You got something with a, a jaw problem or something like that, it might be a reason to call them. Uh, examine their feet, make sure their feet are in good shape. Uh, above all, examine their udders, palpate their udders, make sure there's no lumps or abscesses or unsoundness in that udder because that will not get better. And what you'll end up with is uh, a, a U or a doe with twins or triplets and she's only got a partial udder. Uh, very frustrating. So now is a good time to, to call something that's got problems that's going to give you problems. Um, also, at this time, you can um, evaluate these animals in terms of their internal parasite status. You can do a FOMACHA evaluation of them. Uh, you can look at their how thin they are, and based upon their FOMACHA status and their body condition score, uh, you can choose to uh, to treat those that need it with a combination deworming program, um, and that'll have some good positive effect potentially on at least on a few of them that might be affected by internal parasites. And then we'll talk more about body condition scoring later, but this is obviously a time to body condition score the whole off at the whole outfit. And then if a vaccination program is needed in terms of vaccinating for uh, reproductive diseases, um, this is potentially the time to employ that vaccination program. Not all operations are going to um, vaccinate for abortive diseases. Uh, it's a it's basically a case by case, farm by farm situation. Um, if if you have a cl fairly closed operation and have not had any problems with say like vibriosis or chlamydia in the past, um, then you know you may or may not vaccinate. However, if you don't really have a closed operation, if you're uh, taking your animals to shows to sales. You're co-mingling with other females. You're buying in females. Um, then you know a, a vaccination program may be what you need to do. You probably need to work with a, a veterinarian to determine what you exactly need. But if you are vaccinating for vibriosis, um, you know that's that. This four to six weeks before is 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 the time to do it. And then if as far as um, and zoonotic abortion or chlamydia, you want to. If they've never been vaccinated before, you want to vaccinate them six weeks before uh, ram or buck introduction, uh, followed up a month later with a booster, and then you just need an annual booster um, once they've had their initial series of vaccinations. So another reason to uh, check them out and, and bring things in four to six weeks before. Okay, let's talk a little bit about body condition scoring. Uh, a very, very crucial management technique that's very important in the breeding season, but not just the breeding season. It's a very useful technique to have familiarity with throughout the production cycle. Um, I think it's one of the most valuable tools you can have in your toolbox is how did body condition score accurately and repeatedly. And we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Basically, sheep and goats have a body condition scoring system from one to five. And one would be an extremely emaciated animal. Five would be heavily obese. Um, and this body condition scoring system was developed in the 1960s, so it's been around, you know, 70 years almost, or 60 years or so. So it's it's been a fairly proven a fairly proven managing technique. Um, a well a well managed operation is going to see a normal fluctuation of body condition body condition scores throughout the production cycle. Okay, and that's normal. What you want to avoid is extremes at that fluctuation. So, for instance, at weaning, if you've got healthy milking females, the uh, majority of them got twins on them, and even if they're fed well and if they're milking well, they're going to get a little thin. 
Uh, they're just going to be in a negative energy energy balance, and they're going to get a little thin. So a two body condition score is certainly not unheard of. We and we'll talk more about this in a second in terms of breeding, but we do want to get them back in shape by breeding to about a three. On uh, early and mid gestation, they might be a two point five, and then of course in late gestation and and at lambing or kidding, we want them around that three to three point five, especially dependent upon uh, how many feed eyes they're how many feed eye they're carrying. Um, this URL at the bottom of this screen is uh, is a video that we made a couple years ago on how to body condition score sheep. It's about an eight or nine minute video. It has a lot of demonstrations. Uh, one of my students and I made this video. Um, it it'll it, it is kind of advantageous over just giving a um, WebEx webinar because you know you can actually show video that doesn't lag and stuff. So. I would encourage you, if you want more information on body condition scoring, just look up this URL on YouTube, or you could probably just put in your favorite search engine, Purdue Sheep Body Condition Scoring, and it'll pop right up. All right. If you're really interested in this stuff and want more information, um, this is a really good review article on body condition scoring. Um, and its effects on productivity, uh, more specifically, its effects on reproductive performance. And it was uh, written by Kenyon and et al. in 2014, and it's published in the New Zealand Journal of Agricultural Research. Basically, they reviewed the literature of scientific, of scientific reports from around the world and drew some conclusions. Uh, of course, when you look at a, a lot of number, a, a number of different uh, research re reports, you're going to get a little bit of variation. But they did draw some, uh, some I think, some very interesting conclusions based upon uh, peer-reviewed research studies. Basically, the body condition scoring at breeding was that one of their one of their summary points was is positively correlated to number of lambs weaned per ewe exposed. Exposed. So, you know, however, it it does plateau at about a body condition score three. So. If you've got a bunch of views that are 2.0 and you get them to 3.0, you're going to have a higher winning percentage per U exposed. However, from going from 3 to, say, 4.0, it's going to plateau. You're not, it's not going to be a linear um, increase. And, in fact, in some cases, it can be detrimental. Uh, moderate body condition scores, and I found this very interesting, about a 3.0 had actual lower embryonic mortality than either low body condition scores or very high body condition scores. Um, pregnancy rate, or the number of used bred, increased up to a body condition score of two and a half to three, with really no further improvements above that level, and sometimes a decrease over that level. So if you've got overly fat ewes, or if you've got overly fat does, uh, this oftentimes is not an advantage in terms of reproduction. So kind of in summary, they found that a curvilinear positive response was uh, seen in reproductive traits due to body condition score. Uh, in other words, increase in body condition score to a point, and that was about 3.0 to 3.5, uh, was good. And then you're unlikely to see any other improvements. And then actually, especially in the case of embryonic loss, it's actually detrimental. So their final summary was that they recommend a body condition score of a 2.5 to 3.5 at breeding and in early to mid gestation to optimize reproductive performance. So like I said, if you there's a lot of a lot of information in this article and uh, you can certainly find it if you if you so desire. All right, before we talk any more about body condition scoring, it is a very good technique to have, like I mentioned. However, there are limitations to body condition scoring. There are caveats to body condition scoring. Uh, number one, it's somewhat of a subjective um, technique. Okay, it depends upon the experience and you know the the evaluation of a person, which means it's not a hundred percent objective. Um, however, there has been research shown that that experienced producers, experienced personnel that do use body condition scoring, it does have a pretty high level of accuracy. Uh, but it needs to be repeatable. Uh, the more you do it, just like anything, the better you'll get at it. Um, the, another limitation 
is it's not as useful in some sheep breeds or it's not as useful in goats. The reason why is that some sheep breeds and most all goats tend to internalize body fat before external carcass type measurements are or the fat is laid down. So in other words, they get you know they get internal body fat, you know, around their organs and their body cavity uh, before you'll see a uh, fat deposition, say, on their ribs and up on their spine and, and down through their hooks and pin area. So those are kind of limitations. The sheep breeds that tend to internalize body fat would be th breeds like fin sheep. Most of the hair breeds, any pretty much any fat tail breed, and then a number of the dairy breeds. And then, like I mentioned, goats do tend to internalize fat before, before carcass fat, um, especially compared to wool sheep and many types of breeds. So if you have a breed like that or a situation like that, body condition score is still valuable, very valuable, but you might want to consider using body weight in conjunction with it and then kind of keeping some records. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is that um, the propensity to have a good body condition score is a heritable trait. So you could actually select for it and get a, a, a herd or a flock that tends to have you know, a, a more desirable body condition score. And it, I mean, y'all have seen it. You know, some some does, some ewes are easy, what we call easy keepers, and then some are hard keepers. So that does tend to be a heritable trait and is probably worth some selection to on it. All right. So the body condition score system is a one to five. And to move one body condition score, say, let's say move from a two to a three, um, it takes about 8 to 10% of her body weight, kind of dependent on her frame score, uh, which is a, f a fair amount. So if you've got a 150-pound ewe um, and you want to move one full body condition score, it's going to be 12 to 15 pounds, okay? So let's take a little example here. Let's say we have a 150-pound ewe, and we've gone through and evaluated, you know, our, our operation and we have decided that we'd like to get another half of body condition score onto these animals before breeding. So you need to put seven to eight pounds on her, basically, depending on her frame score. Um, so if we wait to do this only two weeks before putting the ram or buck in, um, in, in terms of this is a sheep example, but that means she's going to have to gain a half a pound per day. Now, that's a hard gain for a mature female. Half a pound a day means you're feeding her hard. A high-grain, high-volume diet, uh, not optimal for breeding, and, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take some hard feeding to get that half a pound per day on her. If we waited 30 days, that makes things a lot simpler. We only need a quarter of a pound a day. Probably going to take some grain, also a good pasture, if we do it 60, uh, 42 days or six weeks before, you know, it's a little less than two-tenths of a pound a day. So the point is timely evaluation and then timely, um, and then a timely uh, uh, implementation of your nutrition and management program. It makes things doable or, or very difficult to do. So, again, now's the time. All right, so... Quickly, generally, if you look at the, all the literature about body condition scoring, they talk about doing it at the lumbar region. So what, what body condition score is, in its most basic, it's, it's, it's a description of the energy reserves of an animal. So since fat tissue is basically an energy reserve, we're describing them based on their fat tissue. However, in severe cases, muscle tissue can be used as an energy reserve as well. So as we look at the body condition scores at the lumbar region over, over a range from 1 to 5, emaciated to obese, what's going to be evaluated here, and this is pretty much has to be evaluated by palpation by using your fingers, um, is the prominence of the spine, the prominence of the transverse process, and that's where if you would put your thumb on the spine and take your fingers and put it at the edge of the loin, if you can kind of reach underneath that loin and feel those 
those little bones there, the trans, that's what's called the transverse process. Then you also can evaluate them in terms of fat cover over the, over the loin eye muscle, as well as the shape and the fullness of the loin eye muscle. So as we're looking at a condition score one, which is called emaciated, you're going to have a very sharp, prominent spine. You're going to have um, a very shallow loin eye because they've lost muscle here because they've used, uh, they've mobilized muscle tissue to serve as energy. I have no fat cover over the, over the muscle tissue. And you're going to have very sharp, easily palpated transverse processes. Looking at a condition score two, which would be cons considered thin, not emaciated, but thin, uh, you're going to still have a prominent spine, a little bit smoother, a very thin layer of fat cover over the muscle, and the transverse process will be able to be felt, maybe even distinguished each one of them, but it's a little more difficult and they're a little more rounded feeling. Uh, if we look at a condition score three, an average score, um, you're going to have you're going to be able to feel the spine, but you're going to have to press a little bit. Uh, you're going to have a full muscle, a little bit of fat over that muscle. Uh, it's going to be more difficult to um, to palpate the transverse process, and and so forth. Then, and a condition score four, which is considered a fat animal, um, the spine's difficult to to, to uh, palpate. Uh, you can see noticeable fat cover over the muscle, the full muscle. And um, the transverse process is, is very difficult to feel. And condition score five is obese, and it's just more of the same as a condition score four. So these are subjective, but with practice, with experience, they are pretty, um, they're pretty repeatable. All right, so the book says to use just the lumbar. In practicality, I and many others tend to use other uh, anatomical points on the animal as well. Uh, certainly, palpating the lumbar, palpating the spine, palpating the transverse processes, feeling for the fullness of muscle and the fat over the muscle, very, very useful. But to fine-tune it a little more, you can look at other areas. Um, um, you know, in the, in the lower, basically the lower one-third of the body cavity, you can look at that elbow pocket, the, the flank, the rear flank, and see how full and, dis, and uh, descending those are. <clears throat> you can look at the breast or brisket area of the animal and see how full and how much fat there is or isn't in that area. This is a body condition score three, both of these, same animal. Um, you know, this animal is fairly smooth appearing. You don't see any hooks. Uh, you don't see a spine sticking up. Um, Full but not fat through the fore and rear flank. Looks pretty healthy to me. Um, as you look at the front, you know, there's a little bit of fatty tissue there, but certainly not excessive. It's full but not fat. Um, look at the rear view, fairly smooth, smooth through the rump area. Um, and it, this angle is not the greatest, but if you could look down their top, you, if they've got a kind of a rounded shape instead of a square shape, you know, that. Or, or versus a very sharp, prominent shape, that'll give you an indication also. Um, let me go back here. I also like to feel and palpate the ribs and the backbone up through here. I also like to palpate the hooks. That's a really actually a really good area. And then also palpate and look and see how full they are through that rump area, because most of that's not muscle, it's fat. Um, so there's a number of ways to do it. Um, you start kind of with the lumbar, and then you can fine-tune it looking at different an other anatomical points. Uh, converse, compare that to a body condition score five. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, this, this is obviously a, an obese animal. I mean, look at the, the front end here. Look at that fat pocket up in the breast brisket area. F just tremendously fat and over non-productively fat through that lower one-third, through the fore and rear flank. Um, you can even see a little fat pone right here at its, at its, at its uh, pins, which means it's really fat. Because basically sheep and goats, as they lay down fat on, their, on themselves, they fatten from the front to the rear and from the bottom to the top. So as they start laying down fat, these areas here start first, and then it 
kind of moves upward and backwards as as they fatten. So this animal is very obese. You can see, <coughs> I hope you can see there's a little bit of a line down their top, and that's not a line of muscle like you might see in a really heavily muscled pig. That's a line where the spine is, but on either side of it are fat depositions that's causing that little line. I mean, this is obviously a very um, obese animal, a non-productively obese animal. Are uh, you look at a sheep? And it looks to me like it's either right during or, or after weaning. You see the lambs in the background. Um, this is a very thin animal, a dangerously thin animal in my estimation. Um, the problem with getting an animal, and this is definitely not a two. This is a, this is a one, I would say, just looking at her, and she is in short fleece. So you can, can draw some conclusions. But you, look, you can see its ribs. Uh, you can see there's no fat definition here. You can see, even with wool on them, that there's a sharp spinous process. You can see a hook there. And if you look at their rear quarters, you can see this animal has actually lost muscle through its rear quarters. So a very dangerous, dangerously thin animal. Um, you know, if they get challenged with some health problem, like, say, internal parasites or pneumonia or, you know, anything, uh, they're in danger. Their life is in danger. They're so thin they can't hardly fight it off. So we want to avoid situations like this, even at weaning. Okay. What you can do by body condition scoring in a timely basis is you can try to <clears throat> use it to your advantage, and especially this year as feed prices have gone just through the roof. Um, you can go through and body condition score every ewe or every doe that you're considering breeding and then you can sort those uh, those animals based upon their body condition score. So some of them might be fine, wait until about two weeks before putting the buck in to start flushing them. Some of them might need um, some supplemental feed four to six weeks before because they're thin. Maybe they get raised twins. Maybe they're young. Maybe they're old. There's, they're, you know, maybe they're a heavy milker. Um, there's oftentimes good productive reasons why an animal gets thin. It's our job as managers to get them back into shape to give them a fighting chance to remain productive. So, you know, if you if you assign individual body can score, scores, then you can segregate them. And um, those that need fed more, you can start earlier and feed them a little more. Those that are in pretty good shape for whatever reason, uh, maybe you can start them later and you can save a little bit on money on co feed costs and still have a productive uh, group of females to breed. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, tie this together with the breeding season management. Um, flushing is a word that I'm sure many of you have heard uh, very often. And it's not like flushing embryos like we do nowadays, but it's an older, it's, it's use has been used longer in, mainly in sheep than even embryonic embryo transfer has. And it's simply, uh, increase in energy content to the diet to mainly try to increase body weight and increase body condition score. So it's an old technique. It's a proven technique. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a useful technique. Um, but it's most effective in those animals that are a little on the thinner side. So those that are less than a three body condition score generally are going to tend to respond more positively to flushing than those, say, in a 3.5. Um, and it's most effective early in the breeding season. So as the ewe or the doe comes out of the anestrous period, the non-breeding part of the season, and they start to enter into where they start cycling, you know, as the days get a little cooler or the nights get a little cooler and the days become a little shorter, um, you know, that part of the cycle where they're just coming out of an estrus into an active estrus season, flushing is most effective at that point as well. So, you know, it's more effective, say, in August than it is, say, in October. Not that it isn't effective in October, but it's more effective earlier. Simply increasing energy content. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them flushed up in body condition score and in body weight to try to increase ovulation rate. Okay, and I mentioned this before, if it's done properly, you know, you're basically going to get about a 10 to 20% increase 
and twinning percentage, which is good, usually. Um, essentially, you're looking at kind of a target body condition score of a 3, um, probably no more than a 3.5. Now, let me just say something right now, though, about that. If you have fatter U's or fatter does, let's say they're 3, 5 to a 4, um, the time to make them lose some weight is not at the breeding season, not at the breeding season, because um, you don't want them losing weight then. So if they're a little fatter than you desire, don't put them on a diet then. Wait till they're pregnant. Wait till they're, you know, 40, 50 days past, um, past their breeding date. And then you can put them on a lower plane of nutrition where they can maybe lose a little bit more. And, of course, the best way to get fat off of you or off a of doe is lactation. So you just might have to be patient. But do not – I do not recommend you having them lose weight before breeding if they are overconditioned. Uh, if they're underconditioned, then, you know – we're going to want to feed them better if we got enough time. So kind of a target goal to me, a target goal would be about a three, uh, probably 3.5 on the high side. Um, and, you know, some of the things we mentioned before, usually during the breeding season, in terms of feeding, uh, most producers are um, breeding on pasture. Those, those females are grazing. You turn the ram or the buck in, and it's and it's uh, they're bred on pasture. Now, not all are like that, but many of them. Um, basically, what you want to do if they need it, and probably a fair number of them will, is you want to supplement with some sort of high energy feeds. That's kind of the easiest way to do it. Um, which means, you know, about a half to a pound of corn or equivalent of corn um, daily will really do a good job of flushing up, increasing body weight. Uh, increase in body condition score, especially if they're healthy, uh, you've, you know, controlled parasites, and they've got a good mineral program. And uh, I want to say mineral mineral program at, at, during breeding season is very, very important. Get yourself a good quality mineral with the upper legal limits of, of selenium. Um, if those animals are being bred in a dry lot and not grazing green forage, uh, vitamin E is also important. Um, you want them to be on this flushing diet, you know, two to four weeks before introduction of the ram or buck, depending on their body condition score, <clears throat> and then two to four weeks after the ram and buck has been put in with them. So, you know, if it's four weeks, you know, that's basically not quite two cycles, just, just shy of two cycles. So you're going to have some that have settled right away, and then you're going to have some that may have taken a couple of breedings to say, to settle, so you know you've you've got you've got some variation there, but um, important to keep them on the on uh, that ration for at least two to four weeks after you put the buck in too. Uh, you want these animals to be fed about two to two and a half percent of their of their body weight, um, depending on their condition score, of total dry matter intake daily for flushing. Now that doesn't mean the corn; that means everything, whatever they're eating in terms of uh, forage, your pasture, uh, supplemental energy sources. If they're in dry lot, you know, it might be hay uh, and, and uh, some sort of grain, but about two to two and a half percent of their total of their total body weight and dry matter intake daily for a flushing effect. Um, also, in terms of increasing twinning or ovulation rate, um, you know, we want to, and also decreasing embryonic loss. Um, one factor, in addition to nutrition, is the season at breeding, okay? So it's well known if they're, you know, sheep and goats in general, and there, of course there's some individuals and breeds that, that aren't like this, but in general, sheep and goats are considered seasonally polyesterous. So they'll have many cycles within a season, and they're short-day breeders, so that's generally, you know, as the days start getting shorter, and then as the days start getting longer and, and early to late winter, then they start going into anesterous. So those ewes that are breeding for spring lambs or kids generally ovulate at a higher rate than those that are breeding for fall falls, for those that can do it. And that, that's for natural, not hormonally induced. Um, so, And then within a, a fall breeding season, uh, those bred during really optimum daylight to dark 
time periods tend to ovulate more eggs. So what that means is the ovulation rate naturally is higher in late September, October, and November, <coughs> excuse me, than it is, say, in July and August. Um, so anyway, and it's been well determined that ewes and does will ovulate at a higher rate after their first heat as they come out of the anestrus period. So that's called a ram effect, and you can use a teaser buck. Um, probably a good idea if you're trying to breed early. Uh, probably not near as useful if you're, say, breeding in September, October, or November. Okay, once breeding is finished, we've got the ewes or the does. They're in good shape. Um, you know, we got them at a good body condition score, and uh, everything's gone well. Kept them on the flushing diet. Um, it's man, uh, management is still crucial, especially with goats, but really with sheep as well. Um, since uterine implantation doesn't occur, so you know you've got the egg that's fertilized, it starts to develop into an embryo, and it's free floating in the uterine fluid, and it's not implanted into the uterine wall yet. And because it's not implanted, there's a high risk of embryonic death loss. So what we want to try to do is not reduce those gains we've made through our good management. Maybe we've got a 20% increase in 20 or 30% increase in ovulation rate, and we're looking good, and then we mismanage our females, and then we get a 20 to 30% death loss, embryonic death loss. So we want to try to decrease this reproductive wastage, if at all possible, as practical as we can, primarily by reducing stress. Uh, so that's one reason why we leave them on the flushing diet for two to three or four weeks uh, after the breeding season starts. Don't change things. Keep them in good shape. Keep them going well. Uh, and the big sources of stress during this period, of course, would be hot weather, getting heated, uh, any health challenges. You know, if you've got a lot of foot rot in your flock, it's another good reason to get rid of it. Uh, pneumonia, things like that, uh, transporting, you know, hauling them here or there or whatever. Just the loading, the transport, and the unloading is very detrimental to um, reproductive performance uh, at that time period. Uh, Co-mingling females, uh, if, if you, you know, they're not going to fight like a like a ram or a buck, but they will fight and they will establish social dominance, and that can be stressful, especially to those that are lower on the totem pole. <clears throat> and then any working of the sheep or goats, handling, bringing them in, you know, that that's not the time to be doing management things. Just let them be, keep them as calm and, and, and uh, comfortable as possible, and, um, you know, you're going to tend to have a higher reproductive performance, especially during that first 40 days of gestation. And the big one is a sharp decrease in body weight in that first 40 days of gestation. So we've done a good job getting them up to a good body condition score. They're up to an optimum weight, and then we just turn them out with nothing to eat, and they lose 5, 6, 8, 10 pounds right away. And that's very detrimental to um, embryonic survival. So we want to try to avoid those things. Uh, I just said a lot of that, uh, but... In early gestation, the big thing is is that that's when the placenta growth is occurring, and this can affect productivity down the line because it affects the birth weight of the lambs and kids. Um, so you don't get these small, weak, lack of vigor lambs or kids um, that um, you know take a lot of management inputs. I already said some of this you, uh, in early and mid gestation. You want to avoid a sharp weight loss. Um, if these are older ewes, older does, um, you want to try to maintain their body condition score, just kind of keep them steady. Uh, if they're if they're overconditioned and in mid gestation, say, you know, the middle part of that 150 days, um, they can lose a little bit of weight safely, about a half a body condition score. You don't want them to lose too much, but a little bit. Uh, if they're young, if they're old, if they've got a issue, maybe some teeth problems, elderly or thin, um, we actually may want to try to start increasing the body condition scores in early and mid gestation as, as they go into uh, 
late gestation. Now, this isn't a fancy f- bunch of feeding that needs to be, be done. You just need a good quality forage, uh, good grazing. If you've got adequate and you're not overstocked, fall pasture should be adequate. Uh, if it's at least of moderate quality or higher. Uh, even grazing some crop residues would be adequate, especially if you supplement a little bit of protein and a little bit of calcium. And again, the mineral program during this time period, very important to maintain reproductive performance and to maintain body weight. All right, let's not forget the ram or the buck. And this is an issue that I imagine most of the people that listen to this webinar would be considered small farm flock operators. Um, You know, the average number of ewes in a farm flock in Indiana is like 25 to 30. Um, That's not even a, I mean, 30 ewes for a mature, healthy ram, that's a walk in a park in terms of breeding. He can breed those easily. So that means it's not even a one ram outfit, okay? Um, So the majority of operations are, you know, one or at the most two ram or buck outfits. And I have been the sheep specialist here for 32 years, and I know that most producers do not double check the fertility of their rams and bucks. Some do, some do, but the majority don't. And um, if that happens, of course, it's a potential disaster for these one or two male operations. Okay, and it's well documented, well documented that up to 10 to 15 percent of rams or bucks have some issue that either affects their fertility or affects their ability to actually breed and mate with ewes or does. And that is a pretty high number. All right, so the best thing to do, again, four to six weeks before breeding season, is to just simply get a breeding soundness exam done on your rams and your bucks, okay? It's not hard. Generally, you're going to have to do, some of it you could do yourself, actually, but, you know, to get a full breeding soundness exam, unless you can actually collect and evaluate semen, you're going to probably have to have a veterinarian do it. Um, There's three parts to it. One is just an overall physical exam, which most producers can do themselves. Uh, the second part of it is the inspection of the reproductive organs, which some of that producers could do themselves. Some of it they probably wouldn't be that comfortable. And then semen collection and evaluation, which not many producers will, would be able to do themselves. So that's when you need some professional help. The physical exam, of course, you're looking at body condition score, and now with your ram or your buck, you want them just a little bit on the high side of that range because no matter how they're fed and taken care of, they are going to lose some weight during the breeding season, and that's normal. So we want a little bit of reserve there. So as they, you know, start after 25, 30 days in breeding season, they've lost some weight, but they're still not considered thin, thin. And you just look at simple things like their structure, their feet and leg structure, their soundness. Um, you know, their eyes, their teeth, how they move, things, just common sense stuff. You know, make sure they're dewormed if needed, you know, hooves trimmed and in good shape, you know, pretty simple stuff. But if they've got, you know, bad teeth and they're limping on, you know, limping, say, on their left rear and they're kind of wormy, um, I'll tell you, that'll, that for sure will affect their ability to uh, to get the job done. Then you can evaluate their reproductive organs, uh, simply palpate their scrotum, and examine their scrotum, look for injuries, (coughs) Uh, look at the frostbite, look for disease issues, Uh, make sure that the testes, there's two of them, that they're reasonably similar in size, uh, that the the testes aren't too soft, that they're not too uh, hard. You know, palpate the epididymize. things like that. And then, you know, if a veterinarian is doing it, they're going to probably extend the penis on that animal. They're going to look for scars, look for any lesions, adhesions, uh, look for um, pizzle rot, you know, warts, anything that might potentially affect their ability to uh, extend their penis and get and, and get a U bred successfully. And then a scrotal circumference is taken, which is basically having the testes extended into the uh, scrotal sac 
and taken a measurement at the widest point, and this is a little steel tape measure, but you can also use like a sewing tape measure, which is uh, pretty useful. And, um, or you could take a string even, and my headphones came unplugged here, sorry, and then measure that as well. And there are some guidelines, and this is for sheep, they'd be a little smaller in a buck. Um, these are some kind of common sense guidelines on uh, on kind of the minimum scrotal circumference that we look for based on age. Um, in terms of semen collection, there's two methods. You can use an artificial vagina. Uh, the ram or the buck is helpful if they've been trained in this and they've been collected regularly. You're going to need a, a U or a doe that's in heat. Or you can at least fake them being in heat, and then you've got to be able to collect that. And it's it's kind of it takes some practice to be able to do it. And the most common method is simply to use an electro ejaculator, um, or you just collect the collect the uh, the semen event uh, artificially, and then the, you know the simple sample is going to be extended a little bit. Uh, you're going to be looking for the volume, the color, any contaminants, and contaminants would be things like red blood cells, white blood cells, things like that. Uh, look at the motility of the sperm, and then look at the morphology. So a breeding sinus exam uh, goes a long way to making sure um, your rams and bucks are ready to breed. And that that is all the difference in the world in terms of having a successful breeding season. Uh, the limitations of a breeding, a breeding sinus exam is it's just a one-day snapshot. Uh, <clears throat> basically, you're looking for animals that got a problem that may affect. You're not looking for really, really fertile ones as much as you are looking for ones that might have some issue that affects their their ability to breed. So it's just a one-day snapshot. Um, it doesn't account for uh, their breeding activity, you know, their libido, how aggressive breeders they are. Um, they may be perfectly fine, everything looks great, but if they've got no interest or if they're shy breeders, uh, then that doesn't do much good. So we also want to do a close observation of breeding season. Uh, one big aid is a breeding harness. I'm sure some of many of you use this. Simply a contraption that fits around a, a ram or a buck's shoulders. And basically down here at their brisket area, there's a, a colored crayon. And you can see this U's been marked with red. That U's been marked with red. And you can put these on different colors so and then you need to rotate the color every uh 15 to 20 days for goats and every 14 to 16 days for sh for rams <clears throat> so if you start with say a lighter color let's say a, like a lighter yellow um and then let's say we put on a red or a blue that's darker and if this or if we put on a black one for instance so if this you here was marked with red pretty pretty strongly and we kind of record at least what week it was or what day it was ideally, then if I put a black crayon on there or a dark blue crayon on there and she comes back and all or most or many of her pen mates or breeding bunch come back with blue marks on top of their red, then that can tell you that there's a potential problem with the ram or the buck's fertility. Uh, you're going to have some recycle, but you shouldn't have a very high percentage. And if you do have a high percentage, probably ought to be examining your ram or your buck ASAP. Uh, this is a question I get quite a bit. How many females can a ram or a buck breed? Pretty straightforward. Uh, a mature, healthy ram that's in the prime of his life, that's passed a breeding center's exam, he can, he can breed 50 to 75 ewes um, if he's in good shape. And if he can't, he's not much of a ram. Uh, bucks, a little bit less, 30 to 50 does. If they're, let's say, like ram lambs or bucklings, or if they're, you know, viable genetics and say a ram or a buck, but they're older, um, but you still want to use them, you probably take half those numbers compared to the mature, healthy one. So pretty good guideline. It, it kind of vary a little bit on individuals. All right, just quickly a summary. Um, probably one of the most important things is is preparation. Give yourself plenty of time to prepare. So if there's something needs to occur, there's time to get it done. Uh, and that means evaluating the use and the dose for their health and soundness and their body condition score. 
uh, the lower threshold of an of a of a body condition score three should be the goal, not the average of the oper- of the female herd or flock, but a lower threshold. Um, because if you if you average three point oh, that means you're going to have probably a fairly high number of them in the in the low to mid twos, and those will not perform as well. So kind of a a lower threshold of a three. And that means you're going to have some three point fives, maybe some two seven fives, but um, be careful how you do that. I'll use a flushing program. Uh, when you start that, depends on their body condition scoring. Uh, at least two weeks before, <clears throat> maybe as far as six weeks before, if they're a little thinner. Uh, make sure the mineral nutrition program is sound. Very important during breeding season. Uh, take care of the ram and the buck year round. Have a breeding soundness exam performed on the ram or buck at least six weeks before breeding. Uh, pay attention during the breeding season. Breeding harness can be your uh, helper. And then if you do breed ewe lambs or doelings, we never really talked about this, but I'll say it right now. If you're trying to breed them, breed them in a separate unit. Um, they just won't compete with the older uh, user does. And with that, we have finished. I will take, oops, any questions? Okay, I have some questions. Okay. Let's see. So we are in the process of launching a Canadian Nigerian Dwarf Association website. And our goal is to provide new and old breeders a one-stop shop for all things goat. And in this regard, would you be willing to allow us a link to these presentations? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I would also say, I mean, there's other presentations that have gone on, kind of were kind of the tail end of the pandemic, thankfully. But I mean, there's been all kinds of webinars given in the last year and a half, all good ones. Um, you know, Purdue has other resources. You're, I mean, that's what we're here for: is to try to give you as much help as we can. Feel free to link to anything that we have in terms of extension publications, videos, webinar recordings, uh, etc. Please do. Yes, and I have pretty much all of our presentations are on my YouTube channel. And so if you search for my name, or I think there's a link to my YouTube channel, and the email that you're going to receive is a thank you for attending. And so I would like to ask everybody to pay attention when you get an email after this program. It's going to have a link in it for a Qualtrics survey. We just want to know what you learned and what we can offer you in the future. And so we really appreciate it if you would fill that survey out. I said, feel free to ask any questions. Feel free to email me or Dr. Neary if you have any questions about anything you've learned at this or any of our other webinars. 